Hey everybody, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com. I uh, have received hundreds of emails from people asking me why it's taking so long for me to post this next video. The reason why is because I'm on a tour of, a speaking tour uh, in Texas libraries. And I've been speaking literally from one end of the state to the other end. If you look at a map, you can tell Texas is a big state. So I've been on the road a lot and I've not been able to get into the studio until today. So uh, I'm going to try to get a couple of more of these posted. Uh, the problem is I still have a month left of the tour. So I'm going to be on the road quite a bit, but uh, I'll do my best. We are very quickly getting close to episode 100. And uh, my friend Becca is driving me nuts about wanting me to do something special for the 100th episode. So I've decided I'm going to do something special for the 100th episode. I'm not going to tell you what, but it is going to be kind of neat. Um, and uh, that will be coming up soon. I believe this is episode 96. So the 100th episode is coming up relatively quickly. All right, let's get into it. Ethan from Nexar Malta says, how do you find out who wins in a fight between Dinosaur X and Dinosaur Y? P.S. I like Jurassic Fight Club and I'm going to order it soon. Well, Ethan, I'm glad to hear that you like Jurassic Fight Club and I hope you like the video series. Um, okay, people ask me all the time about who would win in a fight between this creature and that creature. Let me tell you that there is absolutely no way on earth anybody could possibly know the outcome of a fight that took place between creatures that we can't physically see. So, when I answer those questions, what I do, Ethan, is I look at the build of the animal, I look at the weaponry of the animal, and I make an educated guess of what I think could occur. But there are so many variables involved, like for instance, are we always talking about two completely healthy animals? Are these the biggest they could be? Um, how old are they? Those kind of things have to be taken into consideration. So when you hear me tell you my opinion of who would win in a fight between X and Y, those guesses are simply based on my best opinion, based on all the evidence that I have available to me. All right, uh, Adam from Dublin, Ireland. Adam asks, why does a hadrosaur have so many teeth? Adam, that's a pretty cool question. Here's the deal. Um, hadrosaur's teeth are a little bit different than most other dinosaurs, because rather than just having individual teeth that we can see when he opens his mouth, instead they have what we call a battery of teeth. And what that is, is you have hundreds of teeth lined up side by side to form something that kind of looks like a brick. Each tooth lays side by side to the next one and it adds this gigantic grinding surface. The reason why they have so many teeth is because the vegetation they eat is incredibly tough and fibrous. Um, eating vegetation, eating anything for that matter, in order to get to the nutrition that's inside, it has to be unlocked. And the way it's unlocked is we chew it up and we break it apart. If you had the ability to swallow a whole apple and not chew it, well, unfortunately, most of that apple then is going to pass through your digestive system and your body's not going to get any of the nutrients. It needs to be broken apart and pulverized so that every bit of the nutrients can be extracted. Hadrosaur's teeth are designed to do that very thing. Their teeth are made to literally turn that plant material into mush so that they have the ability to extract as much nutrition as possible. And that, Adam, is why hadrosaurs were so uh, successful as a dinosaur, because of those amazing battery of teeth. All right, Garrett from Tyler, Texas. Tyler's not too terribly far from San Antonio. Of course, when I say too terribly far, I mean I've just finished driving well over 2,000 miles across Texas, so I can tell you distance, I guess, to me is all relative of where you live. All right, Garrett says, hey, how are you doing, DG? Garrett, I'm doing very well, thank you. He says, my new favorite prehistoric reptile is Saurosuchus, but it says that it preyed on Herrerasaurus. But aren't Herrerasauruses too fast to catch for an old school reptile? He says, P.S. Allosaurus is awesome. Nice job there, Garrett. Way to, way to throw in Allosaurus, buddy. I appreciate that very much. For you new viewers, yes, Allosaurus is my all-time favorite dinosaur. And Garrett is pander, pandering to the host. And it works here, my friend. So thank you very much, Garrett. All right, uh, Garrett, that's a great point. 
The idea that predatory animals hunt other predators is not necessarily common in the, in the animal kingdom, and I don't believe it would be common in the dinosaur kingdom. Usually, predators do not like the taste of other predators. That's an odd statement to make, but that seems to be the case. Predators prefer herbivores as prey. Now, certainly if Sarsuchus had the opportunity to catch a Herrerasaurus and kill it, it probably would. But as for being an animal that preyed upon them, I do not agree with that at all. Mostly, to your point, it's because it would be a complete waste of time. He's not going to catch something as advanced as Herrerasaurus. Uh, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. Just because you live together at the same time in the same place doesn't mean you are prey. It probably means that these two predators were rivals and probably competed for the same food source, but hunting each other, I don't think so. All right, Pedro from, I think this is pronounced Aviro, Portugal. Pedro, I think that's correct. I hope it is anyway. Pedro says, good morning, George. Good morning to you, Pedro, and to your family. Uh, he says, how are you today? Pedro, I'm doing great, my friend. It's kind of nice to be back in front of the camera talking to you guys. Uh, he says, I don't think you remember me, but I am one of your friends on Facebook. Pedro, of course I remember you. In fact, I just sent you a, an email, I think, the other day. Um, if I understand correctly, Pedro, I think you had surgery uh, for your appendix. Is that correct? I just answered, Pedro, I think that was you that sent me that. If so, I hope you're recovering well, my friend. He said, why did Ceratosaurus have that horn on top of its nose? Could the horn have been, some kind, have been used for some kind of smell or color that attracts prey or females? Thank you for your time. Pedro, that's really a cool concept about uh, smell. We don't often talk about pheromones or smells or scents to be used from uh, how dinosaurs use them. Uh, yes, it's certainly possible that perhaps there was some kind of gland that would allow that to emit uh, perhaps a pheromone that would attract a mate or threaten a rival or even attract prey for that matter. Um, we don't really know what the function is. It's pretty strong. It's pretty robust. My best guess is that it was simply used to be able to help other members of its family identify it. Perhaps the bigger that blade on the nose was, the more mature it was. That's sort of a signal to rivals that perhaps you need to stay away from me because I'm older than you, I'm wiser than you, and I will kill you. <laughs> All right, um, Eric from Bellevue, Nebraska says, Hey, Dinosaur George, there's something about the skull of Triceratops that has been confusing me. I have seen some that have these spiky things on the edges of the frill and some others that don't have it. Also, some Triceratops have horns that are long and straight, while others have horns that are smaller and curved. Can you help me figure this out? Because when I look at pictures of Triceratops, I don't know which is more accurate. Uh, thanks for your time and take care. Well, Eric, thank you very much for your courtesy. Um, I can understand the confusion with Triceratops. Triceratops to me is a lot like modern day cows. You can have an entire herd of the same species of cows, yet you'll see hundreds of variations of horns. Perhaps both horns stick forward, and some they both stick up. One sticks down, one points left, one points right. Those kind of variables occur in the animal kingdom. They're not cookie cutter stamped out animals. So that's one of the reasons why you see a variation in the horn design. Those little blade-like appendages on the edge of the horn, uh, yes, yeah, some Triceratops seem to have them and some don't. That could represent perhaps maturity of the animal. Uh, maybe it could also mean that perhaps only the males had them or maybe only the females had them. The difficult thing about Triceratops is that sometimes we look at those animals and perhaps we're looking at a different species that is just similar to, to Triceratops and its horns are dramatically different and that could also be the case. I would just simply say this, um, Eric, dinosaurs are all individuals, even though they come from large families, each is an individual and each has slightly differences. It's no different than humans. All right, everybody, that's it for now. I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get this to you. If you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page and submit your question. Keep in mind, we receive now thousands of emails every single week, so it is just impossible for me to answer them all, but I'll do my best. While you're on my website, follow me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Become a friend of mine on Facebook. We do some cool stuff there. Keep remembering that uh, the 100th episode is coming up and it will be something special. Take care, everybody. For you young people out there, make sure to practice your reading. And for everybody, always use good manners because there's nothing more important. See you guys soon.